I'd like to um, welcome our guest speaker tonight, Kano. Kano is going to be talking about the Ghana connection to Coast and Marine tonight. Uh, so Kano's Aboriginal background is Ghana and Narunga. He is a cultural educator that works with the Catholic education sector and has been doing so for the last seven years. Kano teaches at the Marine Discovery Centre in Henley Beach. He, he has learning, uh, he has been learning, sorry my eyes are going on me. He has been learning the cultural history of the Aboriginal people's history for some years now under the guidance of his uncle, Carl Telfer. Kano also dances as part of the traditional dance group, Yalaka, meaning old wisdom, new ways. Yalaka has done many smoking ceremonies and welcome to country for leading festivals and events. Kano now teaches a wide variety of knowledge. This includes the traditional language of the Ghana, Mayana, geographic mapping, hunting techniques, music, playing, storytelling and dancing. Kano does a great job of trying all of this and weaving together the understanding from the traditional people of Australia. Their deep connection with the spirit of the land, all that live on it and the ways that people lived in, the high, in a highly sustainable way. All right. I might um, hand over to you, Kano. You've got a presentation you can put up on the screen. All right. I will come back for questions after your presentation. No trouble at all. But um, yeah, I guess just a quick introduction as well. Um, so my name is Kano Worrell Martin. Um, and yeah, again, just like Carl mentioned, I am a Ghana and Naranga man um, and have been learning, edu uh, I've been working within ed education for quite some time now, um, focusing in on, uh, because of my work at the Marine Discovery Centre, I do actually focus in on marine environmental um, practices and environmental sustainability practices and try to integrate the cultural people's knowledge of those things within the education system as people come over to meet the Marine Discovery Centre. Um, but I have put together a quick little, uh, I guess, PowerPoint presentation to also go on some dot, dot points around a lot of the aspects of the things that I do actually teach at the centre. Um, those will be hunting practices, uh, resource gathering, and a whole range of other different things as well. Um, cultural mapping and yeah, so um, I guess without further, further ado, let's get into it. Um, and I'm very, I'm actually quite new to the whole Zoom sessions. This is my first Zoom and the wife has very, very generously spent some time with me to actually show me how to work this thing. Um, so bear with me for a moment just to make sure um, everyone can actually see that I am on my screen right now and um, oh, I've seemed to have muted. Uh, Carl, can you just get a confirm that we can see the... Yeah, um, yep, yep, we can seal that. That's great. Sorry, I was muted. Beautiful. Um, so I'll just start from the beginning. Um, so this is the, I guess, the, the little bit of the understanding of the Ghana people's connection to coast and marine. Um, I am a Ghana and Naranga man, as previously mentioned. Both of these groups actually are neighbouring within South Australia. Um, uh, one of which the Naranga people live on the York Peninsula, and my Ga my Ghana side actually live within the Adelaide metropolitan area. And again, have been learning uh, the cultural knowledge from my uncle for quite some time now. And I have a long, long way to go. Um, everything that I have learned is actually coming from my family background. And within what we call Ghana is actually, um, w w within what we call Ghana is actually, you know, there's a lot of different groups within that as well. Um, and the, the learnings that I get from my uncle's based upon what we call, um, well, our family nation is the Malawira Miena, which means the dry forest peoples, um, uh, the dry forest people, which again is just kind of like a group within the Ghana nation. Um, so that's a bit of where the knowledge of, that I am going to be pre presenting tonight is actually coming from. Um, there are many different types of groups within the Ghana nation. There are roughly about eight um, different, I guess, borders between what you would call the Ghana nation and each of these clans or groups will have different understandings, different stories 
and different practices and all these different systems around law and a whole lot of different things as well. Um, so what I do teach and how I do teach it uh, is based around those kinds of things. And I'm working in education. I am there to kind of pass on my knowledge to younger generations and pretty much anyone that comes through to learn at the center. I teach language, I teach dance, I teach hunting. I can show people how to craft materials. And um, I sometimes take people out onto country to show them how to forage for these things. Um, and at, at, at any point as well, if you feel like I'm going too fast or you have a question, feel free to ask. Um, and oh, let me go back just for a second. I do focus my teaching mainly on primary school because I do work at a primary school. Um, however, every now and then I do work within uh, um, secondary schools for particular programs and also work with adults. Um, so I guess a little bit about um, the, the Ghana nation as it is, the Ghana people are known to be the traditional landowners of what we do call the um, Adelaide Plains. Um, and these areas will range between, as you can see there, um, after the migration of the Aboriginal people from up in the Northern Territory making their way down, the Ghana people actually settled between the areas of Cape Jervis in the Flora Peninsula um, and also into Port Wakefield on the eastern shore of the Gulf St. Vincent. Um, they are a neighbouring uh, nation between what we call the Narunga people, which come from the York Peninsula. Again, my other side of the family background, and also the Paramank and Nurunjeti people on the Victor Harbour area. Um, and I also have family ties within a lot of these areas through um, people being married into um, the families, either from the Western, uh, Western side or actually traditionally being married into these areas as well. Um, and a lot of the things that I teach is based upon the area that we call Wongiolo. So Wongiolo is actually the traditional language name of, um, of the, uh, of the Henley Beach area where I work, um, uh, uh, otherwise known as, as Gulf St. Vincent. Um, and... Sorry. Um, I guess what I teach is also the importance of the marine area and the coastal area. Um, and not only that, but the dependence on these kinds of areas. Um, you know, the, the resources and minerals that are found in these areas, a lot of which um, some of you might or might not know, um, these resources and animals and things like that are only things that are found within the South Australian area. Um, and only found within our shores. And so these things um, that were, uh, the, these minerals and resources that are gathered within the area here on, uh, on South Australian shores was something that was actually used as a currency back in the day um, for trading from other, other areas. It might be the Paramount people from it down in Victor Harbour. It might be the Naranga people from over in the York Peninsula. Um, but they would actually use these things as a trading material because it's something that can only be found within the South Australian areas. Um, it might be trading with people from in the riverlands and all those kind of places as well. Um, so it's going out to regional places. So um, that's a lot of what I teach is based upon the people within the South Australian area and some of our practices around those things. Um, not only that, I do teach a lot about the Junal areas as well, because a lot of these places um, on, the, on the Junes uh, are very, very significant places. They were camping grounds. We have um, uh, freshwater springs and things like that, which were a kind of pivotal um, point of the the Ghana peoples, but not just the Ghana people, but all the other people within that area. It was like one thing that they depended on for their livelihood it can be the freshwater springs. Um, it can be things like the plants and um, flora or fauna that you find within the area. 
So for the spinifex grass, for, for those of you that don't know it within South Australian areas, it's actually one of the grasses that retain a lot of the sand um, and build up our sand dunes. And those, those plants actually have significant medicinal purposes. There are resins that we actually use within, um, within those, well, there, there are resins within that grass that we actually use for medicines and things like that for smoking ceremonies. But not just that, also um, crafting and stuff like that as well, because resins, as, as most people know now, um, when, when melted down, they basically just become like a solid glue. Um, and so we would use those for um, binding um, things like quartz minerals or rocks and stuff like that to our boomerangs to make axe heads and a whole, a whole range of different tools. Um, and then we have things like the pig face plant, which is pretty much like a, um, uh, it's almost like a succulent, I guess. You'll find it throughout a lot of the South Australian shore areas. It's a bright, vibrant, vibrant green. It does look like a, um, like a succulent and it, through its um, flowering period, will actually have this vibrant pinkish kind of um, flower on the top of it. And that flower actually underneath it will hold a fruit that is known to taste like a fig. Um, I have yet to taste it myself though. Um, a lot of these areas as well, we talk about burn offs um, that we would, that would, we would do. And a lot of people these days after the, um, I guess after the whole uh, bushfire season that we did actually have, a lot of people are now more um, aware of what these traditional burn off practices were and how they might be used. Um, but there's, you might not understand um, the actual full significance of it. Um, one of the reasons of our um, traditional burn off seasons that we would do throughout the hot seasons or just before the um, the summer period would be not just to prevent a um, not just to prevent a natural bushfire from occurring, but once uh, once those ashes settled from creating that controlled fire, um, the the ashes basically act as a fertilizer, which then revitalizes and rejuvenates the the, the fauna that are that are there or the flora and fauna. Um, and then, you know, you get the animals that will come to graze off of those things. So it's, um, I guess a lot of what I teach is like, you know, uh, the way that the Aboriginal people actually understood the behavior of nature, uh, what, what time would uh, certain animals, animals be moving around? What season would they be moving around? Uh, especially being close to the sea as well with the, with the shore being there and the marine life. Uh, where, where are the changes with different animals moving around and all of those kinds of things. Seasonally, we actually had, um, we actually have uh, six different seasons as well. Some of them are based upon um, weather, but some of them are actually also based on uh, what the animal movements are happening. Um, and what's going around within the natural environment. The, the time that we are currently in is actually what we would call Wiltari, which is the time of the time of the eagle. So it's when he uh, um, would have been migrating around through this area. Unfortunately, due to, um, I guess, uh, the, the demand of buildings and houses being put up within those junal areas where a lot of their food resources would have been, those animals have now sadly moved on to different places where the food still is. Um, and that's something that has happened not just within South Australia, but in many other different parts of the, uh, the world as well. There are a lot of different ceremonial grounds through, throughout the junal areas as well. Um, if these are ceremonies as opposed to meeting places for uh, different tribes coming together, um, but also dance grounds and things like that. So there, there are the, the significance of these places hold a, a lot within them. And there are also not just the uh, purpose of 
uh, dance ceremonies and gatherings and stuff like that. There are a lot of different places throughout South Australia that acted as burial grounds as well. And once people came to dig up all the different sand when they were building upon the, the land here, they found a, a load of different burial sites where, where the remains of the old people were. Um, and uh, you know, those, those were dependent on where people were camping. A lot of what we did uh, when it came to camping in this area here as well, um, we, we never really stayed in one place. So we, were, we would generally move around simply because of what the weather is doing. Um, and now is we, we would actually be just coming down from in the hills because the weather is starting to warm up down here and the, you know, springtime where um, all the animals are starting to reproduce and lay their eggs and all that kind of stuff. So, you know, that sooner or later, there are going to be a lot more animals around. Um, one of the reasons that we would move up into the hills uh, before spring, well, before, before spring is because we would be into what we call kudlila. Um, kudlila basically translates to the time of the cold, where we have all of our, um, otherwise known as winter, where we have all of our rain and uh, the, the strong weather from down on the shore. So we don't want to be in that area. And obviously the natural flow of water on a slope is going to be making its way down. Um, and so you would have the possibility of getting flooded out within those dunal areas as well, because the water would collect there. Um, and because, because of the, the water collecting there throughout Kudlila or winter, um, you, know, you know that once you do come down from the hills, you would actually have your freshwater springs and stuff already there, where again, animals would go to drink their own water and you not only have a water source, but then you also have the possibility of catching the animals that are also around um, to drinking the water that has collected in, the, in those areas. Um, and another thing that I do at, um, at the Marine Discovery Centre where I work is kind of tie in the connection to not just the marine environment and the ocean, which is, which is huge um, for us, and, but I also tie it to the, the local river here, which the traditional name is called um, Karawirapari or Tarandapari, um, otherwise known as Torrens River. So this, the, the, the river itself, um, bef before uh, we have, uh, th there's a, there's a man-made structure in this, in Adelaide now, just off of where the airport is. Um, it's what they call Breakout Creek. And that, that place was actually created to allow the flow of water that had collected through winter to actually pass out into the ocean and spill out into the ocean. Um, because a long time before that, the, the airport area collected within West Beach and Henley Beach and the Western Sea, uh, it was actually a floodplain. And so again, that's just one of the reasons that you wouldn't actually see us in that area throughout winter. Um, so let me just keep going back to, I, I'm sorry, I'm going back and forth between all the different slides. Um, uh, so I, I teach a lot about the history of the river and its connection to the sea um, and the way that the people, the Aboriginal people actually use, utilized the, the knowledge of how, how the seasons work with the river and the sea um, and the, all of these things before colonization. Um, be before colonization uh, happened within Australia as well, the, all the freshwater areas that we had here were um, completely crystal clear, fresh, drinkable water. Um, but for those of you that perhaps live in Adelaide now, um, you know, you definitely wouldn't be going down in summer to uh, go, go to dip your toe in the Torrens River anymore. Um, and that's quite unfortunate. And a lot of the children have only ever seen it as that. Um, and then they go, I'll tell them to go and ask their grandparents or their teachers and they'll end up coming back to me next year and saying, oh yeah, you know, I asked, I asked my, um, my nono or nono, I find that in those areas, there's a large Italian slash Greek background. Um, and 
they, they will say, yeah, they remember the, um, the river being quite clear and they actually used to go swimming there and all that kind of stuff. Um, so it's, it's always good for, um, for making those connections with the students because it might not have happened within their time, but it's, it's definitely happened within the time that their family has been there. Um, and they, they have seen those changes happen or occur. Um, and you know, a, lot of the, a lot of the fish that uh, were in those areas, when we talk about um, the, the, the marine life um, that once were within the area, we had a massive amount of freshwater crustaceans and freshwater fish that unfortunately now these days have again, just like the um, Wilta or the, the eagle, he, who has now moved on to different places because the area is not what it used to be. Um, and their food resources and things like that have disappeared. Um, we, we used to have one of the, one of the favorite ones to catch within the um, Torrens River uh, for, for the Aboriginal people was the yellow eyed mullet. Um, and uh, uh, then over into, as you make your way into the ocean, uh, we would catch things like the, um, the brim and things like that. And then further out into sea, we would actually go out to catch things like butterfish, otherwise known as mulloway as well. Um, and unfortunately, due to all the changes that have happened within the world, uh, those, uh, you, you don't find them around anymore. Um, one of the things that the children always find really inter interesting as well when, I, when I'm talking to them, the second you talk about hunting to any, any kids, they're just like, oh yeah, spears and, and going out and chopping things, it's great. Um, and so that, that always catches their attention when I'm, when I'm talking about tech, the, the different um, skills and techniques. There are massive different amounts of fishing techniques and methods that were, um, that would be practiced, practiced way back in the day. And if you can see from that illustration just there, you can see kind of um, how the, the men are creating those little nets and they would kind of school the fish in and then try to drag them closer to the shore. Um, and some of, some of the uh, fishing techniques would be things like line fishing. Um, but where do, where do we get those lines from? I'll get, those, uh, I'll get everyone to try and think about it. Like, you know, what, what are the resources that we need before we can actually go out and create a fishing line? Um, and one of the cool things these days is that a lot of schools are doing the, the nature play areas in their, on their school grounds. And they're, you know, I guess growing, uh, trying to reintroduce the school grounds that a lot of us might have been used to growing up, just kind of roaming around with sticks and twigs and rocks and climbing on everything and get coming home with scuffs on our, uh, on our knees and arms and all that kind of stuff. Um, but there's uh, a plant out there called the, um, and some of you might know as well, it's called the uh, club rush reed. Otherwise, you, we have the bulrush reed as well. Um, those, those are two of the reeds that we would actually use to, um, uh, to create those, the fishing lines. You, you would get kind of like a small rock. Um, I just realized, uh, yeah, so you'd get a small rock, pop, pop your reed on a flat surface, and you'd slightly tap at it to flatten it. And you keep doing that all, all the way along, all the way along until you've reached the very end. But the, the, the knobby part on the, on the very top, you would actually keep there because it basically acts like a natural knot. Um, and then you would pretty much just kind of wind, um, wind the reeds up, separate them and either plait them or weave them together um, through traditional weaving techniques. Um, and then we have things like bait fishing as well. Um, so something as simple as just getting um, different types of uh, fruits for freshwater, for the freshwater fish, or it might be insects and stuff like that, that you can throw into the water with, from, from those lines, dangle it within um, to, to bait the fish into any nets or onto any lines or anything like that. 
Um, then we have things like trap fishing. Um, and again, from that illustration that you can see just on the PowerPoint slide, you can see how they, would, uh, how they are trapping the fish within the, within the nets that they have. Um, the tidal fishing is a really interesting as, uh, one as well. So um, this is where it kind of really connects to the movements of the ocean. Um, so some of the things that we would actually do is down, down in certain, um, I, I guess, what are now harbours and things like that, um, we would actually just on the shoreline create an archway kind of like that of some rocks, but you would leave a small little gap in between just off of the shore and you'd wait just for the tide to actually come in. And obviously then you'd create a small little pool just within this area. Um, and then once, once the ocean or the, the current and the tide starts to make its way back out, you would either go and lock off or put a little net between the, um, to the gap there to basically assure that none of the fish can get out. Um, or you can go there and do any spear fishing or anything like that while they're, they're just captured within the pool that you've created from your understanding of how the tide works. Um, some of the systems, systematically how they understood the, the environment is just something that I still, um, you know, find out more and more as I learn from my uncle and it's just, it still blows me away anytime I hear from those things and those practices. Um, and then we have things like hand fishing and or spear fishing where it's a very, you know, one of the oldest kind of ways of fishing really, sitting within a current in the river or something like that, or simply just trying to catch a fish by your hands. Um, I've only ever done it once uh, and it takes a darn long time to try and catch a fish with just your bare hands when it's traveling through the currents. Um, but it's, it, it's also something that's really, really fun. And I've, sh I've shown some students how, how those things would happen as well. Um, um, a lot of the, a lot of the materials and that people would collect, uh, they might be from down at the, down at the beach or they might be from um, uh, just up on the shore, up into the hills and things like that. A lot of the oxidized um, stones or, or metals that you can get from in the stones as well can be used to craft things like spearheads for um, making any, any of your stuff like that as well. Um, and uh, some of these tools might include things like the boomerang. Um, and for a lot of people, you know, that uh, uh, most people probably already know what boomerangs are, um, but there are quite a large range of different types of boomerangs as well. Uh, from, from what I understand, there are close to about 300 different styles of boomerangs and a lot of them are used in hunting. Um, some of them are used for fighting. Um, some of them are used for ceremonial purposes. This can be musically, it can be for telling stories, um, it can be for dancing and a whole range of other different things as well. Um, and one of, the, one of the other really cool ones is also a boomerang that once it's thrown, it basically whistles. Um, and those, those boomerangs there, the whistling ones, would actually use, um, in the river areas, you would, you, you would see us using them. And we'd throw them up in the, up in a, up in the sky in a particular direction. And the whistle of that, um, of that boomerang as it's flying through the sky is supposed to mimic the sound of a predatory bird, things like eagles and stuff like that. And so you can distract thing, um, any ducks that are swimming across the, uh, swimming across the, um, a river. And once you, once you've thrown it, you can throw your nets over it because they're off looking in a different direction. Um, one of the, some of the other things that is really, really cool about a lot of the practices within the river and how we caught 
uh, a lot of the ducks when we were out hunting is um, this, it, it, it's a pretty funny one as well. Like it, it seems like it something you might actually see within a movie. Um, but we, we used to use some of the reeds that are in the, in the river, some of the really tall ones and you'd break them in half and they're like kind of hollow through the center. And we'd quite literally use those as snorkels really. Um, and we'd lay within the water um, and use the straw within our mouth basically as our breathing apparatus. Um, and once, once you'd see the shadow of a duck or something like that come over, come over the top of you, then you'd try and catch it as it passes through. You might catch it by the feet. You might just jump out and scream or I don't know. But um, yeah, it's that, that's also one of the ones that recently I learned from my uncle that I found really, really fascinating is, um, you know, a, a, such a simple tool and you see them all, all, all everywhere. And sometimes people might just walk past a lot of the resources that we have in, in Australia and think of it as just a plant. But uh, one of the things that is so fascinating is the way that the Aboriginal people actually utilized and understood how the plants can be used. Um, and again, still, I'm still always finding out new things from my uncle um, that just blows me away. Um, and then we have things like, and I can't, here we are. Um, yeah, so we have things like our Woomeras as well. Um, this is a really interesting one. So if you take a look on the picture on the right, in the top right corner, um, the, the Woomera is essentially like those plastic tennis ball throwing things that you see people with their dogs down at the beach or down at the dog park. Um, but obviously that is something that we're not going to use for throwing tennis balls or anything like that. Um, we use it for throwing spears and it basically just acts similar to like those, um, those tennis ball throwers. It just gives you that extra little bit of extension to your arm, almost like a piston really, where you can launch the spear at a far distance. Um, I've, I've tested them quite uh, uh, quite a lot uh, when going out practicing hunting and all that kind of stuff with my uncle. Um, and I guess an example of how, how much more they can add to the distance of a spear throw is um, like I can throw a spear just with my arm just shy of 50 meters, um, which in itself is a, a fairly long distance. But with the, with the addition of one of the Woomeras, um, the furthest dis distance I've hit so far is probably about 80. So it adds an extra, you know, 30 meters, um, potentially, uh, potentially more depending on how skilled you are at using that tool. Um, one of the really cool things that's uh, uh, about this tool as well is, um, it's essentially kind of like a walking kitchen or a portable kitchen. Um, right where the handle is, um, we would actually stick a jagged piece of quartz in there. So the handle the, um, is actually created again from that Spinifex grass resin. Um, that again, basically is like a glue that we use for bindings and stuff like that. Um, and, you know, Quartz, when broken into a thin edge, is essentially like a broken piece of glass. So we would use that um, not just to spear and hunt our uh, fish or kangaroos or emus or anything like that. We then also have a cutting tool because you've wedged that piece of quartz um, that you've broken into a jagged edge and you can use that as a knife. Um, but then, then, then the other thing as well is that you can actually use this tool to pretty much cook your food in the sense of creating a fire. Um, and that fire would be created just by um, friction. So for those of you that have ever seen how the fire is made by the hands, um, uh, just by using the two sticks as, as so, you would actually use it in that kind of motion uh, with, with a soft wood and a, and a hardwood and you'd keep rubbing it, keep rubbing it until a, the 
the softwoods dust starts to collect and then heats up even more until it creates, I guess, an ember. Um, and yeah, these, these are just some of the things that are really, really fascinating on like the sustainability and the understanding on the different ways that you can use um, a lot of the tools. Next we have, um, this one is called a wadi. A wadi is essentially a type of club um, and is used for hunting small animals like snakes, lizards, um, wombats, possums, um, a, a little joke that I tell the kids is it's used to tell off naughty children and a lot of the teachers get a good kick out of that and want to know where they can get one from. Um, but uh, yeah, and it also acts as a type of digging tool for when we're looking for yams and or grubs and stuff like that, um, but also can be used as a tool of defence as well. And one of the last ones that we have are the skins and pelts that are from things like kangaroos. Uh, obviously, the skins are used, yes, as a type of clothing. Um, and many people have probably seen uh, those, uh, those pelts and things like that used on, on clothing items, um, creating the leathers and whatnot. But some of the sinew and the tendons um, and even the bones would be cre uh, used for creating things like sewing needles with the bones or um, the sinew and the tendons can also be used to wrap around um, some of the tools to use as, uh, to make bindings with it. And that's actually, uh, you probably wouldn't be able to see it on the image, but the woomera, the spear thrower on the, uh, on the opposite side from where the handle is, there's a little barb of wood and that wood has been bound together uh, to the wood by a tendon from a kangaroo's leg. Um, and then you have things for, uh, you could make some of the um, bone jewelry and stuff like that. Some of you may have seen pit images of the traditional people uh, with the bones through the um, septum of their nose and things like that. Um, and those, those items could be used for um, ceremonial gifts for marriage and things like that from families. Uh, and and loads, loads of other different things as well. Um, and sorry, I just noticed there's a question from Yaj to everyone there is currently. Um, I'll answer to that question maybe a little bit after if there's something that uh, you guys need to know. And whoops, I think I uh, forgot to share the image again. My bad. I should need. I, I should probably have the wife here in here with me because she's much better at this. Um, but yeah, so that is, I guess, the um, the run of a lot of the different things that I teach at the centre. Uh, it 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 can be things like the. Um, uh, you know, the, the way that the people use all the different uh, resources and minerals and uh, the understanding of the environment and how the Aboriginal people utilised their understanding um, to their fullest potential. Uh, and it's, you know, something that I am still learning and will p pursue on learning for... I guess until the end of my days, really, because um, you know it is something that I'm definitely passionate about and want to assure that the younger generations um, that may have missed out on it in the past, um, for, for those of you that are maybe over the age of um, 30 to 40, you know these these opportunities of learning about the Australian people's history was just not a thing. Um, and it's really, really great to see that a lot of schools are now uh, integrating it within their curriculum um, in, in lots of different ways. Uh, but I guess that is really a short um, spiel about a lot of the different things that I do um, at, the, at the Marine Discovery Centre. So really, really appreciate everyone's time. Um, and I guess now if we have any questions, I'm all ears or if there's anything that people um, are wanting to know a little bit more about. 
Um, yeah. So, Belinda, were there any questions on the Facebook feed at all? Is um, that... No, only a statement just saying pig based plant tastes like fruit salad. It's yummy. <laughs> Um, one of one of the another one of the ways that we actually used to use the pig face plant, which I forgot to mention, um, is for when we were going out hunting and stuff like that, or traveling for a very long distance, we would actually split the pig face uh, the pig face prongs um, in half, and we'd sit it just underneath our gums here. Um, if you've ever eaten the succulent part, uh, it is it is quite salty. Um, but it's basically something that would help us retain moisture within, within our mouth to keep us hydrated as we're traveling along. Um, because when you're going out hunting, you know, I've, you, could, you could be out walking, tracking one animal for a week, two weeks, maybe even more sometimes. Um, and so you, you'd look at those, you'd, you'd need to not understand how the different ways that you can utilize, not just plants, and not just areas for water, but um, you know, because it's it's something that's just really really cool. Um, and now a lot of people actually pickle uh, the the pig face plant, and I've had it in burgers and things like that, which tastes great. <laughs> uh, the 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 traditional name that we have for the pig face as well um, is what we call kakala. Um, yeah. Uh, I'm not sure if there's anything else or... That, that question you started to read before was a curriculum type question. I can copy that onto an email and send it to you. It's quite a long one about teaching and um, strategies and how to promote awareness and understanding of the Indigenous culture in the classroom, particularly among non-Indigenous non students. So that one uh, might be one for you to... Well, actually, uh, uh, pre previously, uh, because, because I do a lot of... Um, uh, a lot of work within education, particularly within the Catholic education department. Um, uh, they, they've, got, they've got me in to do a lot of different programs around um, cultural awareness and things like that. Um, and then there's sometimes, you know, more in, in depth chats with the teachers around cultural appropriation and all these different things. Um, which is which is great uh, the, that a lot of people are now interested in learning um, and understanding those those different uh, aspects around what it means to educate oneself around culture. Yeah, there was a um, a couple more um, things from um, Yeke on. Um on the Facebook post, where can we find out more on the local um, garden stories? Um, and she also said she lives near the Aldinga Scrub. And I know there was part of the bro I can't say that story there, but I'm not sure. The Tabrookie story, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Not sure where we can find more information. Similar EMS related stories about the marine environment. Um. So uh, the, the Jabruki Trail story as well is actually something that is really close to my family's side. Um, we're, we're, we're actually one of the cultural custodians of that story um, and helps to, my, my nan on, on my father's side actually helps to um, bring that story back. Uh, and there are actually a couple of different links. Uh, let me see if I can quickly find a link for you guys and pop it within the chat uh, because there's a lot of different, uh, there's a lot of different things that my uncle has done um, with the, with councils throughout um, Adelaide, more, more, more so the Charles Sturt Council. Um, but it does actually have, it's about a hundred pages that you can look at uh, um, of, of information. And that's from uh, the, the river all the way down to the coast. Um, and it, it talks about a whole bunch of those different things. Um, if I can't find it quick enough um, and you guys have a pen or paper handy. Um, 
I can tell you what the um, what the search would be for you uh, for you. Uh, so it is within the Charles Sturt Council, and if you were to probably just Google Charles Sturt Council, um, and then type in Carl, spelled K-A-R-L, um, you would probably, uh, uh, and then also Telfa, spelled T-E-L-F-E-R, um, and if you search that within um, within Google, you'll see a lot of uh, cultural mapping sites with, that are linked to the um, Charles Sturt Can Council, and they uh, some of the things that my uncle has done with them around cultural mapping and all the different stories within that area, um, and it trails all the way down as well. Um, Carl said, um, "Nev, tell tell, hang on, let people know that they can contact us at Yalaka." Oh yeah, yeah, that, that as well. <laughs> um, yes. Yeah, so you can definitely. Uh, Yelica is also the the dance troupe that uh, I, I'm in, uh, who uh, Uncle Carl uh, organises all the different things and um, guides guides us and teaches us uh, all all the different information that you guys have just heard me um, present as well. Um, so there's there's definitely a range of different things that we can uh, guide guide you on the right guide you in the right direction um, for finding out all of that different information as and it's one of the things that we always try to teach people as well because it's you know we've had a we've had a lot in the past where um, many people have tried to just get the information for the purpose of educating other people um which is which is great as well but it's one of the things where it's like you know okay you can't do those things within a bracket of just 10 minutes it's you know it's it's a long journey that people have to be passionate about taking um and as as long as like you're going around the right going down the right line to um appropriately collect that information then it is it can rightfully become something um, as long as you've followed I guess cultural protocols around learning um, information then it can eventually be something that is I guess culturally appropriate um, for other people to teach as well um, but yeah definitely contact uh, my uncle Carl Telfer and uh, he's definitely the right man to for any information uh, further to the things that I had talked about throughout this presentation. Um, but I'm not sure if anyone else has any other um, questions. Or... Um, well, there was, um, how is a resin collected from the spin effects? Um, so it's found closer to the roots of um, of, of the plant itself. It's quite similar to also um, the, it used to be called the, I think they've changed the name of the plant now, but it's uh, used to be called the black boy plant as well. Um, the, like the, the, the grass tree that's like got all of its grass parts that hang out and then it's got the, um, the stems that stick out straight through the middle. So found just down the bottom uh, of where the roots are is where you can extract the resins. Um, if that made sense. Mm -hmm. yeah, so it stands within the root area of those plants. Um, also, Geraldine, uh, Geraldine Waldron said that um, she loves hearing all the different um, Ghana names and references. She's doing a workshop at her school tomorrow on an introduction to Ghana language. So that's pretty cool. Um, also, Peter Corrigan said, did Aboriginal people travel over to Kangaroo Island? So uh, one of the really really cool things as well is um, you know throughout the throughout the um, amount of time that Aboriginal people uh, have been living within Australia, there have been many different Earth movements that have happened, um, and we we did uh, we definitely did um, travel over to those areas, um, and it's actually an old spiritual kind of burial site as well for where the spirits go to 
um, after uh, the physical body had passed. Um, and there would be certain times to go over to those areas as well um, and certain ceremonies that you would do before getting there. Uh, but prior, prior to those earth, the earth shifting, um, we didn't need a ferry or anything to actually get across there because the water never used to separate Kangaroo Island from the land here. And so you could actually just walk straight across. Um, yeah, so that's, that's one of the uh, old, I guess, spirit, uh, spiritually burial, burial sites as well. And Carl said we could do walking country story play, place connection to living culture. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Um, yeah, I'm not sure if there's anything else that um, we had one just come through from Kev Black. Who, who should I talk to about the more spiritual aspects and how that relates to the environment? Uh, how, well, uh, I, again, there's there. I'd probably just end up to, uh, pointing you towards my uncle. Um, if uh, Carl Charlie, you, you, well, you, you've got his email, don't you? Yeah, we can um, put details on our Facebook page if you like for all these different places you've mentioned. If Uncle Carl, if you just let Uncle Carl know that that's there's a lot of people trying to reach out for those kinds of things, um, yeah, then okay. you to pass on. Um, contact details and things like that. Uh, I'm, sh I'm sure that we can definitely figure out ways to uh, get people on the right tr uh, on the right track to find out that information. Yeah. Yeah. If um, if Carl's still on the Facebook feed, maybe he could type in the website address if he's comfortable doing that, and people could contact him through that. Yeah. That'd, be, that'd work. If he's not there anymore, I can put it on afterwards. It's no problem. Yeah, and also they can probably contact you at the Marine Discovery Centre, I guess, as well, fairly easily. Yeah, well, 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 yeah, that too, definitely. Um, uh, I'm I'm more than happy for you, Carl. If you want to um, hand on my contact details to people, you've got my email now. Um, yep, no worries. I can do that. Give me my um, more immediate uh, contact um, details a little bit after as well. Yeah, no worries. We can put those up on the page a bit later on. But yeah, if, um, I know you're probably booked out solid at the Marine Discovery Centre, but teachers should probably book in to have one of your tours because I know you've got a great exhibit down there which you've built over the last three or four years. Yeah. I've been working there for seven years now. I feel well yeah. informed. Didn't you, get, didn't you get some funding last year for a big exhibit, like a new build or something? Yeah. Down at... uh, it was the um, through the... Uh, fund my neighbourhood. Oh, that's uh, right. That, yeah, that the government was doing um, the the Marine Discovery Centre when Tim Hoyle was there. He ended up getting a big grant application approved, and they did a um, a, a huge reno renovation of the of the centre that included painting and getting new uh, interactive models and mm. um, all, all those different kinds of things. And um, myself and Uncle Carl were also um, a part of the team that re recreated the uh, Ghana, I guess, cultural learning space within the centre. Um, before that, we just had a small little corner with knickknacks on the floor. Um, and now we have a, a whole room, which is really, really good. Excellent. Yeah, I haven't seen that yet, so I'll have to get down there and have a look if it's yeah. still open. With this COVID. The relationships that Uncle Carl has created over the many, many years of, um, of doing what he does and people, you know, he does it very, very well. <laughs> mm. I'm really looking forward to learning more about the Ghana culture for EMS. Uh, in my last position, I was working on the River Murray and the Kurong mostly. So we used to go to the Kurong quite a bit with teachers and do uh, cultural awareness workshops and uh, go on Bush Tucker walks through with Uncle Tom and Uncle George and is it Auntie Ellen that used to do the basket weaving? Or she probably still does down that way. So she taught us how to do the basket weaving with the bull rush, which was really good. Yeah. But here at um, EMS, we've been trying to incorporate, um, yeah, the Ghana, so the Ghana culture into it, what we do. So stories and words and, and artwork and that sort of thing. So, so we look forward to talking to you and Carl about that in the future. 
No, definitely. Sounds great. All right. Well, I think we'll just run out of time unless we've got another question there, Belinda. Any more questions come through? Um, no, or just um, Carl still on the Facebook feed. Oh, okay. He said, Carl, you need to come and meet our Southern traditional owners. <laughs> Tribal Alliance Group. Uh, where are we going? Tribal Alliance Group that's just been formed. Oh, okay. Yeah, I'd, I'd be. I'd love to. So I've been to see Carl down at the centre quite a few times. I've met Carno at the centre and I've seen Carno's um, traditional dance. So it's been really cool over the last five years or so. So yeah, now that Tim's gone, I don't go there as often. But um, yeah, I think I've talked to Carmen a fair bit over the last month or two. So building some yeah. partnerships there with the centre again, which is good. Yeah, so I'll be happy to come down and visit and um, work out how we can work together, getting this information out to the community and schools and out to our participants at Snorkels as well. Yep. So our idea is to try and get some of these words and stories into our briefings to the community. Um, yeah, so that's that's our goal. Um, we haven't actually got there yet, but I'm sure we'll get there eventually. Yeah, oh, sounds great. All right, well, it's eight o'clock, so thank you very much. Carno for joining us tonight. It was really informative. I learned heaps of different things. I wish I could work, uh, I could remember all the words and stories, <laughs> but <laughs> well, I to write them down. You know where to find us. <laughs> you know, you're not going to get away. <laughs> and thank you, Linda, as well, for moderating tonight. Uh, thanks and for giving me the uh, opportunity as well. It's been, it's been really, really great. Um, <laughs> I'm usually used to having people right in front of me, so this is this is a this is a bit different. And I'm, I'm yeah, sure. it's and the new I'm, world. 